instrument for the Oregon uh, Court of Appeals, and he will be introducing our panelists and giving a little bit more information about the topic. But I want to thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoy the panel. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll say a few words about the format tonight. Each panelist is going to talk for 8 to 10, 11 minutes or so. And when we are done with all the panelists, there'll be plenty of room, plenty of time for questions. So I think we'll hold the questions until everybody's, everybody's done. As moderator, I'll make sure that people stay uh, within their time limit so that there will be time for questions. I will just name the panelists and they'll raise their hand to indicate who they are. And at the beginning of their presentation, they'll tell you a little bit more about who they are and what their relationship is to this topic. So the panelists tonight are Mark Newson, who is a patient with patient services, an RN with patient services at uh, Hospice of Sacred Heart. Dr. Kenneth Stevens with a group called Physicians for Compassionate Care. Father John Evans with the Newman Center, the assistant pastor, of, is that correct? Yes. Uh, Dr. Nancy Crumpacker, who is a physician with a group called Compassion in Dying. And although their names are similar, Compassion in Dying and Physicians for Compassionate Care find themselves on the other side, uh, on opposite sides of this issue. Okay, um, as, as, uh, as moderator, I will take advantage of my position of authority and go first. <laughs> and I'm gonna, talk about, I'm gonna talk about background, the sort of legal background uh, to what's going on with Physician Assisted Suicide or the Death with Dignity Act, which has, as, as you all know, has been getting a lot of publicity because it was argued before the United States Supreme Court uh, on the 5th of October. What I want to emphasize is that, oh, and my, 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 my relationship to, uh, to this issue has nothing to do with the fact that I'm now in the Court of Appeals. My job before I was in the Court of Appeals was as the Deputy Attorney General for the state of Oregon, and I was in that job between uh, 1997 and 2000 when the first, the first rumblings of this legal issue began to, began to be heard, and as I describe the legal background in the interest of full disclosure, I'll, I'll reveal my own very minor uh, role. Okay, assisted suicide. Uh, physician-assisted suicide, death with dignity, whatever you want to call it, is both a legal issue and also, I think, probably much more importantly, an ethical, moral, religious uh, one. I'm only going to talk about the legal, or more accurately, the legal political background. Uh, I think in almost every way it's the least interesting aspect of this problem, but it's the one that's most in the headlines these days. Problem, the legal problem as it now presents itself is actually a highly technical issue of administrative law. It's not constitutional law, it's not family law, it's not medical law, it's administrative law. The issue before the United States Supreme Court right now that was argued on the 5th of October precisely stated is this, and if you don't follow it all, I'll get back to it before we're done. Did the Attorney General of the United States, did the Attorney General of the United States exceed the authority that was delegated to him by an act of Congress called the Controlled Substances Act when he, the Attorney General, issued a directive declaring that a physician who prescribes a controlled substance for the purpose of hastening the death of a patient is not prescribing the substance for a legitimate medical purpose and that therefore is subject to prosecution. Okay, so what it has, what it boils down to is what is the authority of the Attorney General of the United States under the Controlled Substances Act. Now, legal battle goes back, I, I, I suppose you could trace it back a long way, but for our purposes, we will say that it began in November of 1994 when Oregon voters passed uh, the act called the Death with Dignity Act, which was an initiative, a voter initiative, allowing a physician to prescribe a lethal dose of medication to a mentally competent adult resident of Oregon whom two physicians have certified had a terminal disease with a life expectancy of less than six months. Okay, One of the authors of that bill is, is sitting in the audience and I'm sure he's, he's, he's gritting his teeth as I, as I reduce it to uh, one uh, quick sentence, but I'll say it again. 
So the Death with Dignity Act uh, allows a physician to prescribe a lethal dose of medication to a mentally competent Oregon resident adult whom two physicians have certified has a terminal disease and has a life expectancy of less than six months. Um, in November of 1997, Oregon voters rejected a ballot measure that would have repealed the Death with Dignity Act. The next step in the process occurred about a year later. I think it was in about October of 1998. At that point, the head of the Federal Drug Enforcement is it Agency or Administration, the DEA, um, answered a letter that he had received, a letter of inquiry he had received from Senator Hatch and a member of the House of Representatives whose name I can't remember, asking him if it wasn't illegal for Oregon physicians to be allowed to prescribe lethal doses of controlled substances. Wasn't that illegal under the Controlled Substances Act? The head of the Drug Enforcement Administration at that time, a man named Tom Constantine, wrote a letter back to Congress saying, yes, it is illegal. And he made the argument, he made the argument that is essentially the same argument that the United States um, government is still making today. And it involves how the Controlled Substances Act works, so bear with me as I, as I walk you through this. Controlled Substances Act is an act of Congress dating from 1970, passed for the purpose of stemming the traffic in narcotics. It makes it illegal to, among other things, dispense a controlled substance and has a definition of what a controlled substance is. There is an exception to the Controlled Substances Act for physicians, physicians who are licensed. Physicians, physicians are licensed by states. There is an exception for physicians who, in order to qualify for this exception, have to register with the United States Attorney General. You register as a, as a, as a licensed physician and you are, you are put on a list and you are allowed to, di to dispense controlled substances. Um, you have to, to dispense the controlled substances, but only in compliance with rules and regulations created by the Drug Enforcement Administration. Not Congress, uh, but the Drug Enforcement Administration. One such rule says that physicians may only prescribe controlled substances for, and I quote, and this is the key phrase, a legitimate medical purpose. Doesn't define what a legitimate medical purpose is. A physician who violates this rule by prescribing controlled substances for an illegitimate medical purpose, for example, becomes one of these people who gives away prescriptions to drug addicts or sells prescriptions to drug addicts. Uh, such a physician is subject to loss of license and criminal prosecutions. In essence, such a physician is a drug dealer and is treated as a drug dealer under federal law. The attorney, the, the head of the DEA then took the next step and said, furthermore, prescribing a controlled substance for the purpose of assisting a suicide is not a, legit a legitimate medical purpose. Made that determination more or less on his own. Now, when word of that got to Oregon, got to Oregon physicians, Oregon physicians were suddenly a little nervous because following the state, the state Death with Dignity Act would subject them quite possibly to 20 years in, in prison. So in reaction to this letter and fearing that it would become official U.S. policy as opposed to just a letter, the governor at that time, Governor Kitzhaber, sent a delegation to Washington, D.C. to meet with representatives of the Department of Justice, which is the department within which the Drug Enforcement Agency exists, and other executive officials um, also met with the head of the American Medical Association, who at that point was a doctor from the state of Oregon, uh, and the purpose of that delegation, of which I was a member, and there's my, my participation, was to make the following argument to these people to persuade them not to subscribe to the head of the DEA's interpretation of the Controlled Substances Act. We essentially argued that regulation of the practice of medicine has always and traditionally been a state and not a national function. And it is therefore up to each state to decide what a legitimate medical purpose is. States are in the business of licensing physicians, not the federal government. It is not up to the federal government in general or the attorney general in particular. That was our argument. Um, at that point, the attorney general of the United States was Janet Reno. She ultimately agreed with our argument and no directive 
issued from her prohibiting the use of controlled substances for the purpose of assisting in a suicide. When it became evident that she was not going to issue such a directive, a bill was introduced in Congress. That bill was called the Pain Relief Promotion Act, and it would have accomplished the same thing that the directive from Mr. Constantine would have accomplished, but it failed. It did not pass, due largely to a filibuster by, by Senator Wyden of Oregon, who personally, from what I understand, does not particularly like uh, the assisted, assisted suicide, but felt that since Oregon voters had voted for it twice, it was his duty as our representative to uh, see if he could derail the Pain Relief Promotion Act successfully. 2000, suddenly there's a change in the administration. Attorney General Reno is out. Attorney General Af Ashcroft is in. In November of 2001, Attorney General Ashcroft does what Attorney General Reno wouldn't do. He issues a directive interpreting the phrase legitimate medical purpose so as to exclude prescribing controlled substances for the purpose of assisting a suicide. When that happens, the state of Oregon and several private plaintiffs sue in federal court seeking to enjoin enforcement of the Ashcroft Directive, arguing again that it is up to the states and not the federal government to declare what medical practices are and are not legitimate, relying on a case called Gregory versus Ashcroft, uh, ironically in which then Governor Ashcroft of Mississippi argued in favor of states' rights, the state of Oregon argued that um, under that case, when the subject of regulation is a traditional state power, something that states have traditionally done, the court will presume that Congress did not intend to take that power away from the states unless the act of Congress specifically says so in so many words. The, the Controlled Substances Act says nothing at all. Neither sub the Controlled Substances Act nor the regulation enforcing it specifies who it is who has the authority to declare what a legitimate medical purpose is. Therefore, Oregon argued, it's the states that decide. The United States replied, relying on a different precedent, a case called Mississippi, Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians versus Holyfield, that the federal government and not the states defines the terms of federal laws giving them, giving such laws, a single nationwide definition. Otherwise, chaos reigns, and what's legal in one state might be illegal in another state. At the trial court in, in uh, the district, the federal district court in Portland, the United States won. I'm sorry, the United States lost. The state of Oregon won. The United States appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and Oregon won again. The United States took a, uh, an appeal to the United States Supreme Court, which, of course, has discretionary review and, and only, only <coughs> agrees to hear rare, or rare cases, uh, and they agreed to hear this one. And that's the case that was argued on the 5th of, uh, of October uh, just recently. You probably read all about it in the newspaper. By all accounts of people who were there at the argument and uh, who know the, the justices, it's too close, too close to call. It's too close to call. Um, and I'm certainly not going to make a, a prediction. What I want to emphasize before, I, before I, I turn over the microphone is that the issue, the, the legal issue now before the United States Supreme Court is does the, does the United States, does the federal government, Department of Justice, have the authority to declare what is or is not a legitimate medical purpose? What I want to emphasize is what is not, what is not at issue in, uh, in, in the case. The case is now called Gonzalez versus Ashcroft, because I mean Gonzalez versus Oregon, because uh, Ashcroft is no longer the Attorney General. This case does not deal with whether or not physician-assisted suicide is a legitimate medical practice. The issue is who gets to decide if it's a legitimate medical practice, the federal government or the states. That is the issue and the only issue, the only legal issue. Another, another, another question that is not presented by this case is, do people have a right to die? Do people have a right to die? If people had a right to die, 
every state would have to allow physician-assisted suicide. As it is, Oregon is the only state that allows physician-assisted suicide. The question whether or not people have a right to die was decided in a case called Washington versus Glucksburg, and the Supreme Court held that people do not have a right to die, a right to determine the uh, form of their own death. Um, technically, the issue isn't even whether or not the Death with Dignity Act is legal and operative. Now, it is legal and operative. If Oregon loses this case, what will happen is that physicians will not be able to assist suicide by prescribing a controlled substance. They would still be free, ironically, to assist the suicide in the way that Dr. Kevorkian did, which does not involve using a controlled substance. Obviously, it would be much, be much rarer and much more difficult, and it probably wouldn't happen. Uh, finally, the issue that's not before the court is whether or not whatever you want to call it, physician-assisted suicide, death with dignity, is a good idea or a bad idea, a moral idea or an immoral idea, sinful or not sinful. Uh, that's just not the legal question. That's the question that I find, uh, and I think most people find, a more interesting question, and that's what the other uh, panelists are going to talk about. Let's see. Why don't we start at this end and okay. go this way? Well, that's the best legal rendition I've heard of this uh, in a long time now. Um, my name is Mark Newson, and I have grown up in hospice with the physician-assisted suicide. I've been active um, in a variety of capacities, uh, working with patients in their homes since 1993, just prior to the passage of this initiative by the voters in the state of Oregon. Um, and I think as the conversations developed and the vote was being taken, one of the hopes in hospice was that regardless of which way that vote went, what it would do would elevate the conversations about dying in the state of Oregon across the board. Uh, it's, it's one of those topics that nobody wants to touch on uh, unless it's a very controversial one, as this one is um, in particular. Uh, with older groups, sometimes I talk about uh, the difficulty that they may have had talking to their teenagers about sex um, and then relate that to how much more difficult it is to talk to their parents or their children about their dying. Uh, it still is one of those socially not acceptable topics uh, that you sit around at parties or at the dinner table and talk about. And my interest in being here in particular this evening is just to give you some tools and hopefully uh, all of the panelists will give you some tools to look at what the dying process is all about. This is not just a professional philosophical abstraction uh, that we discuss. It's about all of us. We will all be impacted by it. Um, taxes we can skate on. Death we can't. Uh, and I'm hoping uh, that through the course of this conversation tonight that all of you will walk away with something more than you had coming in uh, because you'll be confronted with this at some point in time. Uh, in terms of the physician-assisted suicide, uh, I've seen about every kind of death across the board that there is uh, in my own practice. I have been involved with patients who have uh, utilized the, the right to die and been prescribed medications by their physician. Sometimes it's gone smoothly, sometimes it has not. I've also worked with patients who, even though this was an avenue for them, have chosen more violent means to end their lives. Um, I've also been with patients who have died pretty miserable deaths, not of their own choice, uh, although certainly some people do decide not to take drugs that would make them more comfortable uh, for a variety of reasons, and others who have had the most pleasant passing uh, of their life that I would hope to have for myself and for those people that I care about. Um, this, is, this is a conversation about all of us. It, it's ground up in the legal perspectives, but I think as His Honor mentioned, that's the, the smaller part of it. This is more an emotional component. It's about medicine and technology. It's about the things that are available to physicians to maintain people's lives uh, it's about choices that people make 
It's about informed consent and how well informed are people about the kinds of treatments that are available to them? What will the consequences of those treatments be? Uh, when I worked in oncology, there were times when people wondered whether the disease or the treatment was worse. Uh, and certainly people make choices to stop their treatment, whether it's chemotherapy or radiation, if they have cancer, um, because it saps the, the quality of the time that they have. It seems to be an exercise in futility at times. Uh, there's no question that physicians have the capability and the technology to treat people uh, continuously until they take their last breath. I think a lot of this conversation revolves around do people understand clearly what their choices are, what the uh, consequences of their decisions are, and who are they doing it for? Um, oftentimes I have seen people make decisions not for themselves so much, but for family members. They will continue to do treatment uh, against every seemingly rational reason uh, and be miserable the whole time, but they would prefer to do that than have those conversations with their spouses or their children and uh, give up or acknowledge that Yes, they are human, they are biological animals, and there's a life cycle and they're going to die. Um, it's very difficult to get past that point with some people. And some will go to their death uh, actively denying that this is going to happen. And in doing so, bring those people who are there with them along to that same point. Um, uh, there's a gift that we have to give to those around us in how we model what our deaths are going to be like. Uh, I'm not one on pat phrases, but one that I go back to is that we learn the lessons of living from the dying. And I've seen that reinforced by people who have watched their parents die and have said, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to take care of those things in my life, that baggage, and be able to go to my grave peacefully. Uh, as much as they possibly can. I think that's what this is all about, is, is being able to open up those conversations, uh, whether it's you're for or against physician-assisted suicide, uh, just having the capability to be able to talk about it, to be honest, to look at what it is inside of us, uh, and to figure out how we will live our lives and how we want to die is what this is all about. Um, we, are, we are building the beds that we will die in. And I have no illusion about changing societal views about death and dying. Uh, I'm, I have no illusions about changing the system that I work within. Uh, but if I can make any impact on a few individuals and it will ripple out into the communities that they live in that they will be models of not only how to live their lives, but how to, to end their lives, then I think my presence here is worthwhile. And I'm hoping that all of the panelists here this evening will be able to impact you in some way, uh, that you will walk away with a piece of knowledge that you didn't have. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm Nancy Klimpapper. I'm a retired oncologist. I practiced for 19 years up in Tualatin, a suburb of Portland. Um, and I'm here tonight because I'm dedicated to this law and seeing that those citizens who want to use it have the availability of it. Um, I got into this after caring for cancer patients for 16 years when Oregonians first voted on the Death with Dignity Law in 1994. I recalled how many of my patients through all those years had been struck with a strong, very strong sense of lack of control. Here was this cancer controlling their lives and the treatment and dragging in family members and it seemed to consume them 24 hours a day. And you have probably acquaintances or family members who've been through that. Um, and beginning in 1978, before we even voted on the law, the first of three 
of my patients had a serious discussion with me about their interest in figuring out some way to hasten their death. And these were people that I'd been taking care of. I respected them. And thank goodness they talked to me and got, got my head in the right direction. Um, when we had to vote against the repeal in 1997, I made a firm decision to take a stand to uh, preserve the law, and I've been working with uh, patients and their physicians ever since with the Compassion in Dying of Oregon organization. Um, I take this position uh, based on some, some very uh, outstanding ethical principles, and the first one is respect for autonomy. And the word autonomy means a desire or being able to express um, uh, self-determination. In most biomedical ethical decisions, the principle of autonomy takes precedence. Uh, physician aid in dying, and I'm going to use that term, physician aid in dying, because I don't like the term assisted suicide. Suicide is a violent act taken by uh, somebody who's usually in relatively good health but it's an irrational act. So we don't like to use that. What, what it is, it's physician aid in dying. Um, these, these patients desire to control the timing and the manner of their death. They want to take some sense of control. Um, and it's, it's all about control. Um, there are three other ethical principles that tie into, uh, tie into this issue. The first is beneficence, which means to assist the needy. Dying patients are always needy, but those very few patients who express an, a sincere desire to hasten their inevitable death really need to be paid attention to. Um, the principle of mercy means to relieve suffering. And suffering can be physical suffering from whatever symptoms of pain, nausea, um, uh, shortness of breath. And suffering can also be existential suffering, which means that life has lost its meaning. And we have medications and therapies to treat many of these symptoms, but unfortunately palliative care or the care that's delivered to just treat symptoms and not cure the disease, really we, we don't have the tools to deal with people's existential suffering. And that's what this law is really all about. Um, and as a physician, if I ignore the principles of beneficence, mercy, and to do no harm, that's, that's clearly unethical. Because I know that I have a tool. I have the knowledge to relieve their suffering when everything else has failed. Um, one uh, thing that sort of ties into this that I felt from, from the get-go with, with this law and my experience with it was that it is such an incredible opportunity to sit down with my patients and explore, you know, why are you here? What's really bothering you? And there may have been things going on that they never had time to tell me because they felt I was this rush and it, it's, it's this very solemn, special, you can't compare it to any other conversation. Um, so lots of, lots of thoughts come out and that, that is so incredibly important. Um, what I'd like to show you is our statistics. Kevin? Okay. Um, you, there's a table up there and this is, there's a lot of information on it, but the, the, uh, Columns represent each year that the law has been in effect. 
the numbers at the top of each column are the numbers of patients. The total number after the end of 2004 was 208. Um, and the rows represent concerns that each patient considered or was their basis for considering using the law. So um, when, when we talk about autonomy, you can see that the, the figures in parentheses are percent. And one patient can answer many of these. So you can't compare the, the columns. They're not going to make, make a lot of sense. But 87% of the patients, of 208 patients total, expressed concern for losing autonomy. And that goes, that goes back to what I'm saying, that, that the existential concerns, the existential suffering, life has lost its meaning. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to lose the ability to make decisions. That's the number one concern. 84% of the patients talk about an inability to participate in activities that make life meaningful. What I've heard from patients throughout the years is, I, I, I can't do what, I'm, what I used to do. I don't feel like I'm, I'm me. I'm not me anymore. I can't do these things. Um, they started asking about loss of dignity just two years ago. So you only, um, but you can see that still 80% of the uh, 60 patients who got to answer that felt that uh, uh, that was important. Loss of bodily functions, loss of control of bodily functions, such as incontinence or loss of bowel control, 59%. Uh, being a burden on family, friends, or caregivers, 36%. And what's the most interesting thing, that only 22% of all these patients have ever expressed a concern about the possibility that their pain's not going to be controlled which to me says a lot of good things about hospice and physicians and care in Oregon in general since our law has passed. We have been able to tell people that we can control your pain. Now that wasn't possible in the early 90s or the 80s or the 70s. Patients didn't have very much faith in the medical care system, especially with pain control. So that, that these people, most of whom are on hospice, have been assured that they're not going to have to worry about that. Um, okay, that's all I need from there. Um, the state statistics show that only one-tenth of one percent of patients who die actually take a lethal prescription, and lethal prescription some, that's going to kill them. Um, and this figure represents 10% of those who even ask a physician. Um, so it go, then, then what it says is that even bringing up this topic in front of his or her physician does something to alleviate fears. Patients get put on hospice. They get the care they need. And this is really what, you know, this is what this law is all about is we, we knew very few people were going to use it, but we want everyone, every Oregonian who's dying to have access to adequate symptom control. Um, and one third of uh, patients have never used their prescription. So people got it and they felt comforted, which brings me to my last discussion with a, with a patient. This is a uh, discussion with a patient who's just beginning the process. And she told me last week, after she began working with her physician to obtain a prescription, I feel so light. A big burden has been lifted off my shoulders. I'm even happier now just knowing that I will not have to endure a bad experience. Thank you very much. I'm Father John Evans from the Newman Center, and I'm really pleased to be here and being invited into this conversation. As we heard at the beginning, uh, we're hearing a lot about legal terms and the whole issue there, and the medical terms and the issues there, but it's more encompassing. It's, I, I think it fits into um, what 
Mark Newsom was saying when he said this is a conversation about all of us. It's more encompassing than just one facet like law or medicine or this or that. And another part of that piece has to do with religion. And I only represent one religion, one religious tradition, that of the Catholic Church. And there could be many others represented here and I think many others, and I know many others, do share the same views with the Catholic Church, Church regarding the taking of life in an unnatural way. And that's what we're talking about. I saw the title of this panel was Physician-Assisted Suicide versus Death with Dignity. Both of those things are methods of life being taken or lost, or however you would like to phrase it with no mention of the possibility for life, for a choice for life. I find it even more surprising that we would use terms like death with dignity as if you wanted to die a natural death, it would be without dignity. And I don't believe that, not for a minute. There is a value and dignity to human life and we could talk about this in religious terms, and we will. And we can talk about it in secular terms or more universal terms. And I'll start with that. It has to do with the common good. That our governments, our laws are set up, how we practice medicine, how we conduct our lives on a moral and ethical level are all directed towards the common good that there is a belief that we can aspire to something greater than ourselves and support society, in the society which in which we live in. And there are things that can tear apart the fabric of the common good. And so in seeking the common good, it really does appeal to the best of who we are in our humanity the best of who we are in how we practice our religion, practice our medicine, and practice our law. Harming the common good is something that's very easy to do. And we can undermine it in different ways. And so I just throw this example out for you to think about shortly here. You have someone who uses cocaine. Now, they're not addicted to it, and so is it really okay that they should just be able to do that? We have laws that say that we shouldn't be doing that. Somehow it harms not only the individual, but the common good, more importantly. Surely people can become addicted to it, but the drug trade and the harm it does to our children and our, our society at large is much greater and in the scope of the common good. And we can undermine that in different ways, even in personal ways that we see as autonomous. And so we have to think about these ethical and moral issues and balance them and operate from principles that allow us to be consistent in how we approach life and death. Life is intrinsically good. I believe that as a Christian. I believe that life is good and God has created it good. And it remains so. Even when we do bad things, act immorally, we're still created good. There is still redemption and there is still the possibility to appeal to that good. Now, moving more into the religious sense of things, there's the sanctity of life. The human soul, I believe, as a Christian, and if there are any other Christians here, I would say they probably believe the same, that each person has a human soul. When is that created? Where does that come from? And if the human soul exists, what are we to do with it? Are we free to extinguish a life and a human soul created by God? This is a big question. This is part of what we're here about. And 
it doesn't just have to come down to life and death issues. I just want to focus you back on the Iraq war a little bit. We have a situation over there in the um, Abu Ghraib prison where there was great misconduct. Morally, things happened there that shouldn't have happened. It's sickening to see other humans, even our enemies, tortured, mistreated. That is an undermining of the common good. That is going directly against the sanctity of life without taking it. And that has an effect on us as society, as people of faith and people not even of faith. We can see what's intrinsically wrong with that. Just again, there were four workers who were captured, tortured, killed, bodies dragged through the streets, and then hung up on bridges. That had an impact on us. It said something about how wrong it is that we treat life that way, even though they're already dead. It didn't hurt them, but it has an amazing impact on all of society. We can't opt out of our responsibilities to ourselves, to our families, and to society at large. No one, I believe, in our society should ever feel or be made to feel that their dignity is compromised simply by their circumstances. Because circumstances change. And if we subject people to ways of undermining their dignity in one situation, we're bound to do it again and again in others. Why do we care for those that are in need? We heard so much about autonomy and how that's so important, and it is. It is an important aspect. But why is it that people don't want anybody to take care of them, want anybody to care for them? And so why do we do this? Again, I think it says something about who we are in society, and it's a reflection upon humanity at large in how we care for our dying and our sick. Euthanasia will kill the very thing euthanasia advocates say they seek to preserve, dignity. They extinguish it. Kenneth Stevens, an Oregonian oncologist, told that's the New York weird. Times, that's right, right here. Uh, and he, <laughs> it's okay, go ahead. <laughs> and, well, he, he, I might be stealing a little bit of him. No. Here, but uh, I, I felt we to be careful. <coughs> yes, it just rather than being death with dignity, it is death with vanity. There's something very important. There's just something very important about how we treat our dying and our sick, even those that aren't dying, that respects life. It's my firm belief that whether we're talking about someone asking a physician to help them end their life, or whether they're asking the physician to give them the means, the barbiturates, the pills, whatever it is. On either side, either side, we're killing. We're killing a life. We're not simply just aiding a dying. We're taking a life. And that has a real impact on society. Deborah J. Saunders, Death with Dignity, in a San Francisco article at the beginning of the year, she noted very similar statistics that we just heard. 171 people known to have used medical assisted assistance to end their lives under Oregon law since 1997 don't fit the profile of the helpless and pain-racked patient sold to the Oregon voters. Only 22% listed fear of inadequate pain control as their reason for choosing suicide. More telling, 87% cited fear of losing autonomy. We have to do a better job of educating ourselves in what it means to truly live, that we may die well, prepared well, 
We have to do a better job in educating ourselves so that we know that there are options of real palliative care that can help us to the very end. We have to do a better job of educating our physicians that many of them have never even taken a course in how to help people be free of pain. There's a lot of work to do here, and it's going to happen in many areas, medicine, law, religion, and I'm sure you can name a few more. And so I invite you to think about this, but most importantly, do we really have a soul, and is it ours to take? I'm glad to be here. I, I am uh, Kenneth Stevens. I've been in the practice of radiation oncology for 38 years in Oregon. And I am um, have been the professor and uh, chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology at OHSU for the last 16 years, although I retired from full-time practice two months ago. I've extensively studied Oregon's assisted suicide law since its passage in 1994. The chief argument, as you've heard, of, of the proponents of legalizing assisted suicide is choice and personal determination. In today's society, that's a very compelling argument. However, I think it's important to look at what are the consequences of the law and what is it doing to medicine and to our society, and I'm going to focus on those consequences. Legalizing assisted suicide devalues human life and results in a loss of protection for terminally ill patients against doctors writing a prescription for the sole purpose of causing their death. It's a reversal of the proper role of a physician as a healer and a consoler and a comforter. It's not compatible with those roles. Those promoting assisted suicide send the false message that doctors can do a better job of assisting them in, assisting them in their death than they can of taking care of their medical needs. And I'm con concerned that society will reap the consequences of that demeaning message. About a year ago, in the first part of this year, the British House of Lords sent a select committee around the world. They came to Oregon. They went, uh, interviewed a lot of people in, uh, in Great Britain. They went to the Netherlands, to Belgium, to uh, Switzerland. And they, this is all the testimony. Uh, it's a big book. It's about 700 pages. The legalization of assisted suicide and euthanasia can inhibit the progress of medical advances and tends to result in fewer efforts by the doctor to find a solution to the patient's distress. In the interviewing that they did, when they went to the Netherlands, a doctor of the Netherlands that's quoted in here described a request for a consul consultation from a physician whose patient had gastrointestinal problems. The requesting doctor told him that, in the past, I've taken care of the situation with euthanasia. This patient does not want it. What do I do? How do I take care of this patient? And this doctor, in the quotation here, says, this is my biggest concern in providing euthanasia and setting a norm of euthanasia in medicine, that it will inhibit the development of our learning from patients because we will solve everything with euthanasia. It'll be sort of like a quick fix. Uh, that's, we've even had some problems here in Oregon. Uh, once a patient has the means to take their own life, there can be decreased incentive to ca take care of the patient's symptoms and their needs. Michael Freeland, and this is a case that was written in, up in the American Journal of Psychiatry June of this year. Michael Freeland in Portland was a depressed lung cancer patient. He had been admitted to a mental hospital unit when his doctors were planning for his discharge to his home, and he already had the lethal medication in his home that he had received. A palliative care consultant wrote that he probably needed attendant care at home, but that providing that, atten that at at attendant care was probably a moot point because he had life-ending medication. His assisted suicide doctor did not take care of his pain or his palliative care needs, but did offer to sit with him while he took the lethal meds. This very seriously ill, physically ill, and mentally ill man received very poor medical advice and, more and poor medical care because he had lethal drugs. There are problems with end-of-life care in Oregon. The national organization Last Acts gave a report card to all states in the year 2002. They gave Oregon a D grade for hospice because only a, less than a third of dying Oregonians used hospice and an E-grade for palliative care programs because only 20% of hospitals had that. Pain management has actually deteriorated in Oregon. A study from the medical school showed that after four years of assisted suicide in Oregon, 
that there were almost twice as many dying patients in moderate or severe pain or distress as there had been prior to Oregon's assisted suicide law being used. Actually, pain is not the issue when it comes to assisted suicide, as, as Dr. Crumpacker said, that uh, pain has not, actual untreatable pain, uh, we have not been aware has been the situation. It's the, the assisted suicide has been used more for psychological and, and social concerns. Oregon assisted suicide patients have been described by their doctors as being fiercely independent and controlling people. They fear dependency. And Jackson, in a report to the uh, Oregonian, said that they actually, these people are, are actually saying no to hospice. They look at hospice as sort of getting in their way. They want the drugs. They don't want to have to go through hospice. Assisted suicide has been described as a, quote, policy of privilege. Proponents ten tend to be upper middle class or higher, the white, well-off, worried well. History has taught us that when laws are established by and for controlling people, that the poor and vulnerable are discriminated against. African Americans and Hispanic organizations are very opposed and are very fearful of the legalization of assisted suicide because of their minority status and more limited uh, resources. The arguments favoring assisted suicide are very demeaning to those with disabilities. Proponents of assisted suicide say that there are conditions that are worse than death, and there are organizations uh, of people with, with, with disabilities uh, with the name Not Dead Yet uh, that have been very vocal in opposing the uh, uh, extension of assisted suicide to other states. There are also financial and societal uh, concerns. Um, we do have the Oregon um, Health Plan. It's our Medicaid law. Uh, uh, assisted suicide is a covered um, um, care under that law. It's, it's covered under comfort care. But when I have a cancer patient who has a diagnosis that has a less than 5% chance of living five years, Oregon Medicaid, or the Oregon Health Plan, will not pay for radiation treatments, will not pay for surgery, will not pay for any local treatment for that. We have discrimination against individuals with that. Type. And that's been that way since the start of the Oregon Health Plan. So Oregon's assisted suicide safeguards are not being followed. Uh, there's no protection for the depressed or mentally ill. Uh, in the last two years that we have reports here, 2003, 2004, only 5% of those that died had a mental health consultation. Oregon continues to have a high rate of suicides, uh, especially among the elderly. Um, we have the sixth highest rate, and this is not counting assisted suicide in, in that category. Uh, we have the sixth highest rate in the country. Our rate of elderly assisted suicides is one and a half times that of the uh, nation. There's no real monitoring of, our, of what's happening when the patients take the medication in the year 2004, the last year. Uh, the doctors were present in only six of the 37 deaths, so we really don't ha know what's, what is happening. As I've noted in the above examples, there are serious and dangerous consequences to the legalization of assisted suicide. It's important for this issue to really be studied, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Thank you. Okay. I thank all, all the panelists. your question to a particular panelist or throw the question up in general or whatever. Yes. Um, I was curious, you said that you noted that the Oregon Health Plan doesn't cover uh, treatment for patients with cancer patients with less than 5% chance of living. Is that right? Since the inception of the Oregon Health Plan, uh, well, the Oregon Health Plan um, has a list of diagnoses and treatments, and it's numbered. You know, like a number one is always covered, and there's a, a line that is drawn, uh, and they define that line annually. Uh, assisted suicide is covered because it's under comfort care, and that is within the payment categories of the Oregon Health Plan. But ever since the inception of the Oregon Health Plan, if a patient has a cancer diagnosis with a less than 5% chance of living five years, they will not pay for curative local treatment. They will not pay for surgery. They will not pay for radiation. They will not pay for any local treatment. Now, this includes some brain tumors. This includes patients with cancer of the pancreas. <coughs> um, many of these diagnoses are such that treatment could prolong their valuable life, maybe double it or triple it, but still would fall within that category. I'd like to add one clarification. The Oregon Health Plan does not pay for medication. 
for somebody to hasten their death. They'll get the comfort care, but they will not get the medication paid for. I don't think it had anything to do with the Death with Dignity Act. Uh, there, th what I'm saying is that there, that we have a situation in Oregon where, where patients will receive financial support for assisted suicide, but they will not receive financial support for a potentially curative treatment. I think that's wrong. They're not, they're not providing financial assistance for assisted suicide, for assisted dying. They're getting financial assistance for comfort care, for hospice care. That's what they're getting. Although in the early years, they, um, they were certainly paying for it because they had reimbursed the federal government. Uh, th th yeah. in, in, the early in the early years, the drugs were much cheaper. Um, yeah. Seconol uh, was, uh, they cost $49 is my recollection. And now that we have the, um, actually what is being used now is that they're using injectable medication, but using it in an oral form, and it costs over $1,000, I think. But we're still at Sikonel. It's hard to get. Uh, not right now. Now it's available again. <laughs> it's the manufacturer. Pursue and then you, yes. Oh, yeah. um, I just had a question um, in general. Um, what steps are needed for someone if they wanted to go with the, this is suicide death and dignity, what steps they need to take, and then after they get it, what comfort care is offered? Like what? is, I guess, the package deal. I don't know how you want to say it, but... Well, the, the <coughs> an, an, invi an individual makes a request, a serious request, and after that request is made, that physician assumes the responsibility of making sure that all the other symptoms are taken care of. One of, one of the... the parts of the law states that this person understands and has been offered all the alternatives. This is considered the last, it's a last ditch effort. It's when everything else has failed or, and, or the patient refuses X, Y, and Z. Um, so they, they go hand in hand and when people Call, when patients call our organization, one, the first thing we get them to do if they're eligible is to get on hospice and work with their physicians to see that the symptoms are taken care of. And as I said, only 10% of people who actually make that request to a physician ever get so far as to take medication. Um, two physicians have to certify that a patient is eligible to use the law, and then another two individuals who should not be physicians have to also certify that the person appears to be of sound mind and is not under undue influence. They have to sign. So it takes four witnesses, so to speak, to get through this process. And there's time periods. There's a 15-day that's the shortest period of time from the time that somebody makes a, a request to the time that they could actually get a prescription is 15 days. 30 days to two months. Some people make the request um, while they're still getting treatment, just so it's on record. And it may be years before they actually get to that point where they're eligible. And el eligibility involves, one, being a resident of Oregon, and two, um, having a diagnosis that your condition is terminal and your life expectancy is six months or, or less, correct? Correct. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sir. Uh, Reverend Evans, I view your concern as genuine, your concern for the terminally ill. But I ask this question since you brought up the term soul. Uh, do you believe it is appropriate for to advance its views and attempt to assert itself in an area like this where its judgment in dealing with the soul 
affects many in society, perhaps myself, who don't accept the existence of a soul. How is it that the church, in this very critical area of concern, of pain, and of trauma, will take its standards and its views and attempt to apply them to a major portion of society that does not subscribe to those? That's a very good question. I believe that um, this understanding of how we apply, it's not just in the Catholic Church. I think you, if you look for it, you're going to find it in a lot of different religions. And still, there are a lot of, plenty of other religions that won't agree, so that's true. But we're getting into an area here where maybe it becomes a little more philosophical. And what I want to say is, is there an objective reality or not? Is there an objective reality of God or not? And simply because one doesn't believe that, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's not true. And that's what I subscribe to, that there is an objective reality of God. And if that's true, what does that necessitate? What does that, what is our, my response to that revelation of God? And it's, it's to live it's to live that out, those commands of God, fifth commandment, do not kill, and all the implications that come with that. Now, aside from that religious question and this objective reality, there's also the, you know, serving the common good and, and, and why we have laws in the first place. Why is it that we appeal to something greater? And is it just a a popular fad that we go with? Or what are the values and principles that are going in there? Even if you want to set religion aside. I think that it's very important that we look at how our law is set up and how we exercise those laws in medicine for the common good. Because we can erode the fabric of society. Let me um, add to that that uh in, in, in America, religious, religious groups have traditionally participated in the political process as any other, as any, any number of other groups have. And in, historically, the, 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 f the first and most important time that occurred was when, was, was with respect to slavery. The uh, abolitionist movement was largely grounded in, in, in religious groups. So be, just because a particular belief which has repercussions in the political arena happens to be held by a religion has never in this country, I'm not saying whether or not it should or should not, but has never in this country served to prohibit the, or, or to inhibit the, 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 the religious group from, from trying to further its policy objectives, even if there are those policy objectives also, also happen to be doctrinal. <coughs> That's a question over, yes, in the green shirt. On the nature of the drugs that are administered to them, um, Justice Brown on the Supreme Court raised the question: uh, If the federal government is able to stop a state, which is Oregon, from administering euthanasia for doctor-assisted suicide, would they be then allowed to prevent states, for example, from using lethal injection to? execute criminals. And I was curious uh, what the differences between the euthanasia that is prescribed to patients under the death of dignity law as compared to the stuff that states uh, typically would give to criminals or other methods of euthanasia. And it's basically the, the same drug. They went when you're executing somebody, you are, the, the correct term is euthanize, because somebody is actually injecting something and the patient has no control. Oregon's death with dignity law is all about patient control. I, as a physician, can write a prescription to allow John Doe to buy 
that barbiturate, but he has to decide to ingest it himself. So the, there, that's why it's physician-assisted dying, because the physician is merely providing a written prescription. But, but it's the same, it's basically the same type of drug. It's a very heavy sedative. Your, your, your question reflects a question that was, that was raised mm -hmm. at the oral argument in the Supreme Court, which is, let's say we have another change in administration and the Attorney General who replaces uh, Mr. Gonzalez is, is uh, principally opposed to the death penalty. Could that Attorney General issue an interpretation of the Controlled Substances Act declaring that using a uh, controlled substance in executing a criminal is not a legitimate medical purpose. And if the Attorney General did so, would state officials who are engaged in the process of, of executing criminals be subject to prosecution? So that was, that was a question that was, that was, that was one side sort of mm -hmm. slippery slope hypothetical question. And um, as I recall, there wasn't a particularly satisfactory answer. What would, does anyone remember what the answer to that question was, George? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Now the question on the other side, uh, the hypothetical question on the other side that was, that, that was uh, supposed to be the curveball was someone asked the attorney for the state of Oregon, well, are you telling me, uh, are you telling me Mr. Atkinson, that <coughs> if the state of Oregon decided that it was a legitimate medical purpose to prescribe steroids for bodybuilding or morphine for recreation, would that be, would that be lawful? And Mr. Atkinson said, yes. Probably should have said yes but, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, in the back, in the red. Uh, Most of the time, patients, well, patients are being cared for in health care in 2005 by numbers of physicians. Um, most patients now have a primary care physician which coordinates all their care, and that's either the internal medicine physician or the family physician. And then he or she may have, uh, let's say a patient has cancer, so there's an oncologist, there might be a general surgeon on board. And usually among those people, we can gather the needed people to provide the prescription and the consultation piece. Yes. Is true, like if certain doctors have different, like, you know, like I know some of you were like against it, some were for it. So I was wondering, like, some people would have more of an advantage to get death as opposed to other people? Or I don't know. I, just, uh, I, I might uh, insert that uh, according to your organization, you control about uh, three fourths of the deaths mm -hmm. with the death of dignity. So it's through the doctors that are with that organization. Uh, the um, Dr. Rasmussen, who's a medical oncologist in Salem, has said that the majority of his patients have not been his patients; that they are patients that are referred to him. Um, and uh, many of the doctors have had uh, ha have had a lot of involvement. who participated have done so for a single one time. Only 20% of the physicians who participate have done more than two times. The majority of all physicians only do it once. In the uh, 600 yeah, doc, I know Dr. Esmond has, has acknowledged that he's done more than 10, and uh, Gideon's, part of our group. Gideon's has done seven. So they're certainly, and Nancy, you said that in the press that you would either have been involved directly or indirectly in more than 100. No. That was in the Oregonian. I didn't say that. everything in the Oregon? Yeah. No, that, that, was, that was a quotation from you. Well, I didn't say that. So you're a physician in, in hospice. You, you get patients asking you what they can do to find a, a, a doctor? Yes. Um, uh, my understanding is that there are a limited number of, of physicians in this community who are actively engaged in writing prescriptions for patients. Um, as part of the Catholic health care organization, we have made an ethical decision as part of our policy not to make direct referral to organizations um, 
which facilitate that process for patients, but rather to refer them either to the Oregon Hospice Association or the Lane County Medical Society, who will then uh, refer people on and provide them with direct information for uh, counseling and for pursuing that process. And, and I think that's in line with, uh, with Peace Health's um, ethical stand on a variety of issues. Provides for an opt out. Any physician, any pharmacist has an absolute right to say no, and many do. And those who choose to participate do so on an ethical basis and have the right to do so to, so, to say to those who participate more than once that they somehow are wrong is to also say then those who were refusing to participate are somehow wrong denying their patients access to this law. Yes. I think the panelists on the end talked about this concern about society moving in a direction of, as uh, this law is implemented, it being um, applied more to disadvantaged people. Um, and, and eventually, the folks that can't take care of themselves and don't have the power to take care of themselves are going to be the ones who are victims of this law. What's been our experience to date? Uh, the law's been in effect for a while. Have those been the kind of folks who have uh, uh, died under, under the law? or have been I, I, I can say no. They have absolutely wanted nothing to do with it. Um, it's interesting that uh, when um, Susan Toll did a study of, of patients uh, and uh, who, who were dying, that found that about 18% of, of those that were Caucasian uh, had seriously considered it, but there were 62 blacks who had died and not one of them considered it. They're, they have a great fear of it. Uh, I know in, uh, when it has, uh, as it's been proposed to be a, a, a law down in California, some of the black leaders have said, you know, you want to kill my people. There's, there's a great fear uh, by them of, of this uh, spreading to other states. I think the most um, the most active the most active group that uh, submitted amicus briefs in the United States Supreme Court on on the side of the federal government were disability disabilities rights groups, not because the law has been used against them, but because they see it as 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 establishing the existence of a life that's less than full and and deprivileging them. Lives. It's interesting that when the um, when the House of Lords committee considered, you know, put all the stuff together, one of the things they said in their report was, "How do we establish a law in Britain that will be for these types of controlling people, and yet we will protect the others?" And that that's one of the questions that they had. And again, that law is still sort of alive in in the in the British House of Lords. In the back. Great shirt. I have a question. Um, I noticed that two of you on absolutely opposite sides of the argument used a couple of the same figures to argue your case, specifically the number I refer to is of 22% of the people who have participated in um, physician-assisted death um, claim pain. And I, I understand that Father Evans said, well, that's, you know, he argued saying that that's the, the state painted an incorrect picture of the people who are going to be eligible for this. But what I, I, and I can't, I can't remember your name. Nancy. Nancy. I, what I, I didn't understand, you used that number that only 22% are reporting pain is, a, you know, in your argument for it. And I didn't understand, I didn't understand that. Well, when, you're, you're right, when, when we, we're talking about this law in 94 and 97, we were theorizing that because patients weren't getting good pain control, these would be the patients that would use the law. But only, and, and the way the question is asked, they're concerned about untreated pain. And only 22% of these pe people even express a concern about that. And to me, that says that, you know, we're, we must be doing a good job in treating pain. 
And, and that's not because they were having pain, but it was more of an anticipatory and concern. Right. right. And for my part, I wanted to highlight and point out um, the idea that what they initially put a lot of focus on in 1997, in fact, in the mid-90s, had to do with the pain. But that didn't bear out, and that corroborates what she said. But uh, it, I think also, you know, it's a shift in how people are trying to support this law and its promotion. And I think that's important to know, that what people set out meaning to do didn't bear itself out completely. But there's something that's important here, because there's still 22% of people who do cite that pain, you know, is a major contributing factor, if not the principal one, in why they're choosing death with dignity. And what I say, there are two things I want to talk about. One has to do with, with um, proportionality and, and double effect. It's a moral principle that says, you know, we're, we're, we're doing, we're seeking a good, even though there's a secondary effect that there's bad. So we're seeking to alleviate pain, although a death would occur. And in moral theology, for that condition to exist, it has to be proportional. Meaning, if a man walks in the room with an ax and wants to take out the panelists, we have every right to defend our lives. Even if it means taking that life of the individual that's trying to kill us. That's proportional. Oh, the life for a life or you know, the severity of it. Now, if a six-year-old comes in the room with a spoon threatening to kill us, it's not proportional to then kill the child. And so in the moral theology and the Catholic view, it says that pain, although it's real and we do suffer from it, it's not proportional to taking the human life before it would naturally die. And so that leads us to the question of suffering really quickly. In my viewpoint, the viewpoint of the church, we would say suffering is a mystery. We don't fully understand it, but we believe it can be redemptive. We believe that we can unite our suffering with that of Christ's suffering. And it can be for some good. It can be redemptive. It's not for nothing. And I've watched some people in parishes I've lived in go through chemotherapy time and time again and finally make the decision to stop and let life continue on a natural course and their death on a natural course. And I've watched some people die and sometimes even experiencing some pain in a very graced way. And they taught me and others something about what it meant to die a good death. Not fully understanding pain and suffering, but placing their trust in God and entering into that in full faith and allowing life to take its natural course. Dr. Krumpecker has to leave at nine, which is coming up closely, so we'll have a couple more questions. Yes. Um, I, just, I would like to say, um, first of all, I think it's, I think it's wonderful that only 22 people are concerned about their pain, and that's, that's wonderful to hear. But in the cases where pain is an issue, um, I watched my grandfather die of pancreatic cancer while he begged for someone to help him end his life, but he lived in California, and so he didn't have that option. And I, I totally I respect your beliefs, um, but I, don't, I, I, just, I guess I just wonder how someone can talk to a dying man who's begging for the pain to end because he was in a lot of pain. How can I, do you really think that talking about moral theology and telling my grandfather who doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in a human soul, do you, do you really think that talking to him about the sanctity of life while he, all he wants is to die, how would you explain that to him? I'm just, I'm, I'm interested. I, what you say is a very good point. It's something that uh, was mentioned a little earlier. It has to do with the palliative care or the, the care of helping people in their suffering. And we have a lot of education to do in this area with our medical community. There are people who do specialize in this now, but um, it hasn't always been that way. And there are 
some that have studied it some, but many physicians have not. And I wish somebody would have helped him manage he should, his pain. He should have gotten better pain relief. Right. Yeah. I, think, I think the doctors on the panel can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that if, if in that situation medication is prescribed for the purpose of relieving pain, even if the prescribing physician knows that there's a serious risk that in alleviating the pain, death will ensue, uh, it's both considered le medically ethical and legal, even under the directive, and I, I think the church would probably also go along yes. with this as well, to, 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 make, double, to make the prescription. Double, double it's a matter double of effect. intent. Yeah. 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 Any, any pain, even, I mean, no. I know, no, not no, everyone. Not entirely. I mean, because I, I know that pancreatic cancer is a, a, an extremely painful process, and I, I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I guess it's true, we, my family took them all over, but they went to, you know, natural, they went to, like, homeopathic care in Mexico, and then they did, you know, the traditional route, and he was still in pain, and I just, I, I don't know, maybe he didn't have adequate pain control, but they tried everything, so I just, that's why I'm curious. What we see oftentimes is that in trying to achieve adequate pain control, there are decisions that people make about whether to maintain a degree of lucidity or there's a gray line that you never know where it is until you get there. You can either have a little more pain medication to take that edge off, but with it comes sedation. Lots of people choose not to go that route. And it's, it's a frustrating place, I think, for a lot of physicians and for hospice workers to know that we can achieve better pain control, but people are making those decisions for themselves not to because they value that piece of not being sedated and being able to have that continued time with their family. Those, those become very personal choices about how much pain they're willing to tolerate and suffer through. Yes. I'd like to um, ask the panel maybe a less philosophical question. Um, why is it all, why, or how do they feel about the Attorney General, who is not a medically trained person, determining what is legitimate care? He has no medical training, and I'm just wondering how they feel about that being a determining factor. <laughs> um, he has no business doing that. I don't think it's a medical question. I think it's strictly a legal question right. about states' rights to determine yeah. how they apply the law within their states. Again, we have a federal law, and it's an Oregon has attempted to exempt Super itself C, from right. the federal law. The, an, an analogy is the Oregon Health Plan, which is Medicaid. And when Oregon wanted to do something that did not follow the, the, the federal guidelines for Medicaid, they asked for a waiver. And Oregon has not asked for a waiver in this situation. A real quick one? The yeah, it's just a regard to the election plan. So the Oregon Health Plan is Medicaid, which is the federal plan, so are the same faults in the federal but plan? The, the Medicaid uh, is funded both uh, by s the federal government and by the state. And my understanding is that at least for the uh, assisted suicide, that only state money is used. So like the the, state, the federal, government, federal government allocates money to states uh, for their medical plans, but, the, but in order, as a condition of getting the money, the state plans have to conform to certain federal oh, okay. requirements. Right. It's called cooperative federalism. <laughs> well, um, I want to particularly thank the panelists who came all the way down from Portland for this. Um, you people are actually very fortunate. I don't know if you know it or not, but you have gathered in this room um, some of, the leading, some of the leading authorities on one of the key questions that this country is grappling with at this point, and uh, that's what college is all about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, was in, I was in USA Today as a, I took the opposite opinion of USA Today, so that was kind of interesting to have that last week. <laughs>